Now, the next talk is by Thoralf Dero, um, security strategist at McAfee Labs. A lot of you probably know him from previous DeepSec appearances. And uh, Thoralf is going to talk about Malware Trends 2011. Thoralf. Yeah, hello and welcome. It's a little bit strange to actually hear my name properly pronounced. Um, yes, um, well, I'm, uh, well, I'm uh, talking a little bit about the malware trends, uh, what, we are, what we are seeing um, um, out in the world, what kind of development uh, we are seeing. And um, actually, I will be talking quite a lot about noise and signal. What do I mean with noise and signal? Um, um, the signal is uh, that interesting piece of data that you're, inter uh, that you're actually interested in. And then you've got lots of noise uh, that actually cancel that one out. Noise in, uh, in this kind of form. Um, we have seen a, a total malware explosion um, out there over the last couple of years, basically fueled by an unhealthy cybercrime underground. And so just to put a little bit into perspective um, what, what, uh, what was happening just with the, your normal um, off-the-shelf malware, we are seeing something around maybe 55,000, maybe 60,000 uh, 60, new unique binary different uh, pieces of malware each and every day. And uh, this, well, obviously has uh, got a lot of impacts uh, on one thing, on uh, one side, how we analyze them, um, how we add detection, so most of that is, is now, uh, nowadays um, automated. And it uh, has also impacted uh, the, um, the AV technology that uh, you are using at work. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, um, if uh, you're not using uh, th uh, things like the cloud-based file reputation, you're basically missing something like maybe 120,000 uh, 120, um, current detection. And actually, those are those detections that you uh, want to have at that, at that very moment. Normally, criminals uh, just spam out a Trojan once, and if you wait for your signature-based detection to be, it, uh, to be able to detect that, uh, then so you didn't actually protect your systems. You now have just the tools uh, to find the Trojan and maybe remove it. Um, this, uh, uh, all this noise, unfortunately, is uh, very sophisticated. Um, there are a number of uh, different uh, well, groups uh, trying to uh, trying to make money in the underground market by creating like crime packs, uh, to, uh, Trojan creation kits, um, which they, they, they are trying to sell. And obviously, if you've got the most features, if you've got the most sophisticated tool, uh, then this is uh, selling better. Uh, so the, the, um, all this off-the-shelf malware is pretty much highly sophisticated and um, uh, it's frequently updated. Uh, it comes like with tech support, tech support, usually over ICQ. Uh, so criminals have got all the tools they need. And actually, those tools are uh, so sophisticated that in many cases, um, even uh, nation state sponsored espionage is being done with, uh, with some of those kits. Uh, you may have seen the recent semantic report about attacks against uh, the chemical industry. Um, the attacker in that case used Poison Ivy, which is a tool that is actually freely available uh, for download. And in, uh, um, we, are, uh, we are seeing that um, also the malware is not only limited uh, to, uh, to the Windows world. It's obviously it's, um, the, um, uh, that this is like the most attacked platforms. If 90% uh, users on the planet are using Windows, uh, then, well, there's easy money there. Uh, but still, some criminals are trying to move on the macOS market. And another development that we are seeing at the moment is a dramatic increase um, in malware, in particular for Android. Actually, it's, I'm, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think we have seen a, a, a non-Android uh, 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 Trojan um, uh, in the last quarter. And uh, this, well, rise in the uh, availability of Trojans uh, will make it uh, very interesting to see um, over the next years uh, what is happening with uh, mobile phone security. And uh, some of that malware is actually fairly advanced. It makes use of exploits uh, to take complete ownership of a mobile phone. And um, also from the functionality, what we are seeing there is basically the same functionality that is available on the PC, just carried over uh, to mobile. Many Trojans simply are making money by sending text messages to premium services, 
but we are also seeing like botnet clients uh, for, uh, for mobile phones, um, banking trojans uh, that have got a mobile component, and also some of those trojans allow the, um, uh, allow the attacker to have complete control over the phone, going as far as monitoring phone conversations and then uploading them to a central command and control server. So this is definitely one uh, space to watch out in the future, in particular as uh, many people now start using their mobile phone to do online banking, to access corporate data. And if an attacker knows, well, the CFO has got an iPad, uh, then uh, instead of trying to hack through the entire network to get to the CFO's machine, it may be much more easy to just uh, send an email with a link uh, that uh, you know that CFO will be opening on his iPad. Uh, that is abusing whatever is available on Jailbreak Me to instead uh, completely trojanize that phone. Um, th um, there was already a talk about uh, fake alert scareware, so I'm not going into too much detail on this. Um, it is a multi hundred million uh, US dollar business. Just one company back in 2008, when it wasn't a big problem. Um, that, uh, we were, uh, that we were monitoring uh, was making revenues in excess of 180 million US dollars. And this market certainly has become somewhat larger. Um, but uh, then uh, so a disaster struck the fake AV companies. A disaster in the form of Chronopay, which was like the only company or the most widely used companies to, uh, to do those high risk uh, credit card processings. Um, after the CEO uh, um, uh, went to jail, they stopped processing um, all the orders for the fake AV companies, so they stopped making money. And uh, their business model to distribute um, all those uh, fake AV stuff was to have affiliates uh, which, were, uh, which have been paid uh, per install. Uh, so they didn't make money, so they didn't pay their affiliates, so the affiliates uh, pretty much stopped distributing um, all those pieces of malware. <coughs> and uh, so the good news is there is actually one chart uh, uh, with regards to malware that is uh, going downwards. Uh, we have seen some reported infections uh, from our consumer customers dropping something like 75%, and uh, the current, uh, currently uh, we are still at the same fairly low levels. Um, then we have seen a couple of uh, big busts of botnets um, over the last years. Botnets like Bredo Lab, Rustock, and uh, now this, uh, the old Zedlop uh, DNS changer botnets. Um, they have been taken out of the picture. And uh, what we are seeing is uh, that uh, the people running botnets, uh, they change tactics. Instead of creating big, big, big botnets with like millions of computers in it, um, instead, they are now, uh, now um, well, build up, building up small botnets, um, which are much more difficult to take down. So when we, uh, when we now take down a botnet, it may only be like 20,000 computers in it instead of like 200,000, what, uh, what would have been normal uh, a couple of months ago. So we are not seeing the threats from botnets going away anytime soon. Uh, so it is just getting um, harder and more difficult uh, to actually get at the botnets and uh, to battle them. Um, so, uh, here's a little bit of an overview of, uh, that, um, of the numbers of all the noise uh, that we are battling against. And uh, this noise really drowns out uh, the more interesting stuff that, uh, um, that actually pose more, uh, most dangers for a company. Um, you will also see, uh, the, see the same like, kind of noise if you're looking at the AV logs in your company. Uh, depending on the size of the company, you can literally have like, thousands of detections of various fake, uh, fake alert, um, auto run warms, and whatever in your logs. And you are probably not able to like, follow up on each and every malware detection. So it's uh, quite a lot of uh, in the interesting stuff in your, in your um, company will probably go completely unnoticed. Uh, for distributing um, all those pieces of malware, um, the, um, the attackers are well, resorting to uh, well-proven uh, tactics. One of them is uh, black hat uh, search engine optimization, uh, where they are trying to get uh, like their evil websites on the top, uh, in the top uh, for certain Google searches. 
And uh, well, yeah, you may have seen that report before, where we basically for fun are like trying to find out who are the most dangerous celebrities. So if you were Googling for Heidi Klum, uh, you had like nearly a 10% uh, chance uh, to land on a site that would try to infect you or that would uh, try to offer you uh, uh, some kind of Trojan, very often in the form of like a fake codec, um, where the site looks like a video site. And um, if you want to watch the video, you just get a message, oh, you're missing a codec, but fortunately we, you can just download it here, so please do so. Um, a, a fairly common way of infecting, uh, to infect computers of um, unsuspecting victims. Another way is, uh, that, uh, that is still being done on a massive scale is uh, to break into websites, mostly with automatic tools uh, using SQL injection vulnerabilities, to just place iframe links on a website that in the background then link to your, uh, to your attack server. And um, with automated tools, it is uh, possible to like literally hit millions of websites uh, in that, uh, such a way uh, with uh, just one, uh, one ongoing attack. And whenever something uh, something's, uh, newsworthy is, is happening out in the world, uh, you can bet that attackers are taking that news and uh, try, to, uh, to try to distribute malware uh, that way. Um, whether it's uh, Gaddafi's death uh, or, uh, uh, or Steve Jobs or maybe an earthquake here or there, um, very often, especially with, uh, shortly after the news event, uh, the, uh, the, search, the search results will be poisoned. And it's actually very difficult to like poison uh, the Google search results for Michael Jackson. But if Michael Jackson dies and everyone is Googling for Michael Jackson dead, that's a completely new search. And uh, then it's actually fairly easy for an attacker to get um, his dodgy websites into the top ranking, even as, um, on the, in the top 10 of Google. And uh, well, we are seeing still quite a lot of spam, even though spam is at, this, at its lowest level since 2007, mostly because some of the big botnets have been taken down. And uh, while well, spam, again, is well, basically the noise, the noise uh, that is canceling out uh, the short pieces of signal, like um, in that case, uh, a targeted uh, spear phishing email that is being sent out, maybe with, a, in this case, a Word document as an attachment uh, that then is being used to, uh, to install more targeted malware onto a user's computer. And well, this is now also where we have seen well, the, uh, the nature of attack changing somewhat over the, um, over the time. Hacking for fun is still being done by many people, like maybe breaking into websites just to leave a message, hey, I'm cool, your security sucks, and uh, please donate money for Anonymous or whatever. Um, since like, well, uh, the year 2000, really after like 2005, uh, we have seen, well, hacking, prof hacking po for profit, most, well, all those cybercrime related activities uh, are, be are becoming a major problem. And also, more or less unnoted, um, hacking has also been used for espionage. And um, hacking for espionage is, uh, for an attacker, really, really cost effective. And it's, it has also been proven to be highly effective. Instead of like trying to send your people to, to get employed in, uh, in a company, you can just sit at home and uh, launch your attacks against the company. Um, and uh, if you're a, if you're nation, nation state backed, then you also have like all the time on the uh, um, on the world for that. So you just keep on trying and trying. Maybe you, yeah, maybe you are successful this week. Uh, maybe you're successful for, uh, uh, at Christmas. Maybe you're successful at Christmas next year. That's still okay if, uh, there is, um, if you're being paid by a nation uh, to attack uh, certain targets. We are also seeing like the, uh, the threat sophistication and the capability of damage uh, going up a little bit um, with uh, the various motivations. And the final motivation, clicks creak, that's basically something that so far we've only seen once. Um, where uh, military strikes and the war in Georgia um, uh, fell together um, with strikes um, over cyber at websites and uh, the internet presence um, or the online presence of operations. 
So this is like a kind of the one and first time that we have actually seen such a coordination of a kinetic war uh, together with the support um, of uh, um, in cyber. Uh, there was uh, apparently some talk about uh, making use of uh, um, offensive cyber war arsenal in uh, the fight in Libya. Um, where finally the decision was made to not use it, to not, uh, to not come up with like a first, uh, uh, first incident, or the, not being the first who are uh, massively being involved in cyber war. And um, with, all the, uh, with all those changes, um, it's, well, the old security model that many people are relying on, um, it simply doesn't work anymore. Uh, you know the security model of a flock of sheep? Um, the strongest sheep are normally hiding in the middle, so when uh, um, on outside are the older and the weaker sheep. So whenever a wolf is coming by and uh, has appetite for a sheep, uh, he will just get one of those anonymous um, old, weak sheep on the outside, and the strong ones in the middle uh, survive. And also, well, you basically just try to blend in, in all those sheep. Um, convincing yourself that uh, you are so unimportant, why would anyone go after you? Um, they will uh, most, likely, um, that most likely collect another one. And uh, basically, it's like all the, uh, all the security that sheep are using is your network firewall and a virus scanner, uh, which is basically all you need uh, to get a, a certification of compliance uh, the next time you get an audit. So many companies uh, didn't, uh, don't really bother to, uh, to invest more in security. Uh, this kind of, this is uh, not working any longer now that there are so many targeted attacks out there um, where an actor, uh, well, attacks specifically your company. Maybe you did a press release, um, announced, uh, announced some cool new technology where then uh, people from other nations may decide, okay, that sounds cool, let's try to steal that technology. And um, um, this kind of uh, target, uh, targeted attack um, has become fairly easy. You, uh, you may want to use uh, some of those search, uh, searches um, when you're back at home or maybe while you're sitting here in the room. Um, <coughs> It is nowadays very easy to get um, all the information that you need about a target. Um, with those basic search terms, like, and especially like if you're working uh, for the NATO in Brussels, an organization that is involved in a couple of wars, um, I don't really know why people post that in their LinkedIn profiles so that um, other people know their names and know where to, uh, may, uh, may be able to find out where you're living to strike back at your family. Um, but well, um, even there you get lots of, uh, lots of hits. And uh, following up on a couple of the names uh, that turned up, um, it was, uh, uh, many of those people then had Facebook profiles. Uh, so you're not only knowing their professional contacts, but now you're also knowing their other online friends. And uh, some of them also had a Twitter account uh, with a name that was uh, fairly easy to guess in particular. Um, uh, if you have got all the information from Facebook, and some of them uh, with Twitter even had the uh, location service enabled. Uh, so you could not only see exactly what is of interest for, uh, for a certain target at the very moment, um, you can also see where that target is. So uh, with that, it is fairly easy to then create really convincing um, attacks against someone. So just for an example, I'm kind of paranoid when it comes to opening attachments. Um, well, but it's fairly easy to find out that I'm at DeepSec. Uh, so if someone would have sent me a, uh, a document yesterday, uh, simply spoofing uh, the DeepSec email address, like here's an important update for you uh, concerning your talk at our conference, and attaching a PDF. I, well, I would find it a little bit strange that DeepSec is sending me a PDF, but it makes totally sense in the context. So chances of me opening that would be something around 100%. So uh, with, uh, with, uh, with that in mind, um, you should simply assume that sooner or later um, an attack will be successful, that sooner or later someone is being sent a document that just makes sense, uh, that someone is sent a link that he follows uh, that uh, just makes sense. Um, so um, the, uh, the important thing is then to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, after you assume I've got infected computers in my, in my network, uh, then trying to block the following steps of those attackers. And those following steps, well, most of you are, pretty uh, are probably doing those steps. 
um, whenever you do a penetration test of a, net, uh, of a network. So this is like not really groundbreaking news in rocket science. Um, well, the first part, reconnaissance, we just uh, covered already how easy that is and how easy then the next step is uh, to send your, uh, your targets inside, the, um, inside a company. Um, well, the rig documents, some kind of exploits um, um, uh, to, get in, uh, to get machines infected. And well, after that, uh, the attackers tr are trying to establish some kind of foothold, some kind of backdoor in the network, and then, well, using like basic network penetration tactics uh, to try to, uh, to get access to more machines, to infect more machines, to try to get access to, uh, to privileged accounts, and then use those accounts uh, then uh, to uh, finally get at the, uh, at the mission goal, uh, see, uh, get at the data, and uh, then also complete their objectives after stealing and uploading that data. So if you really want, uh, want to uh, protect uh, your, uh, your organization against that kind of steps, um, you clearly need to focus uh, a little bit away from the uh, just endpoint, uh, endpoint security and instead uh, are doing some kind of monitoring of especially access to your critical data. Just because an account is database admin doesn't mean he, uh, he should be dumping all, um, all the tables out of a database and certainly uh, then not uploading gigabytes of information to some servers out there. So it's, um, having like network, um, well, network monitoring capabilities, um, in particular around critical accounts, um, having some kind of uh, user behavior, account behavior monitoring, um, those are actually the technologies uh, which would enable it to you to attack this kind of attack and then also to, uh, to, uh, to prevent uh, this kind of attack from happening. And um, at the end of the day, the attackers will try to establish all kind of backdoors inside your systems, different pieces of Trojans, different pieces uh, um, uh, that enable them to uh, easily come back next year to get an update of your t uh, technology or whatever data they were trying to steal here. Um, um, well, the, uh, the, uh, the answers for why uh, companies uh, should care um, about all those targeted attacks or um, um, all those APTs in case of nation, uh, of nation state sponsors. Um, well, it's simply like uh, the, uh, the effort and the time that those attackers can, uh, uh, can invest. They have completely different motives uh, than uh, your, uh, the average cyber criminal. The cyber criminal is more or less an optimist, uh, op is working more or less opportunistic. So he is happy attacking whatever, um, uh, whatever victim clicks on his link or um, is uh, stupid enough to install a codec. Um, instead, here, uh, well, there is, uh, there is a clear political motivation or the motivation to get um, uh, a, a data of economic value. Um, so they, they can just spend years attacking you and sooner or later um, they are very likely to, uh, to be successful. Um, so yeah, to, uh, to highlight a, a couple, just a couple of uh, those operations, and uh, those operations are basically just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, usually, it's, uh, whenever it's, uh, we create a white paper about a certain, um, about a certain operation, it is, well, it is that this operation, for some reason, stu uh, stuck out uh, against all the others. Uh, there are literally hundreds of similar operations going on at every given moment. And uh, Operation Night Dragon was uh, one of those operations uh, well, where our forensic team was called in uh, to, uh, to figure out what happened at one side and uh, has seen, uh, um, and, well, has seen okay, this, uh, those Trojans uh, were connecting to this and this command and control server um, where we could get uh, some kind of access to that server. And then uh, we could also see, oh, there were also connections uh, from other companies and um, all those companies, um, at least the seven we know of, uh, they were all companies in the petrochemical field. And um, well, the attackers um, obviously have achieved their ultimate goal. If you, uh, if you are able to steal uh, like explore, exploration data of new oil and gas fields from an oil company, uh, get, uh, the, get their bidding plans uh, for, uh, uh, for oil fields, 
Um, I don't think an oil company has any, uh, has any information that is more valuable, um, has any information uh, that, uh, uh, that is better secured. And then uh, another big operation um, was the operation Shady Red. I don't really know who comes up with all those fancy names. It's not me. And um, well, Shady Red uh, well, was uh, basically only interesting um, because uh, the attackers had uh, uh, connection logs on the command and control server. This normally does not happen. Um, but in this case, uh, well, a connection log was activated, and uh, apparently uh, they never reconfigured their server. Uh, so uh, when we went in, we were able to get historical connection data all the way back from the year 2006, um, when the same group has been running attacks against a various uh, well, a, a broad range of different targets. And it's also a little bit interesting to see like, uh, what kind of uh, companies and organizations have been the target over the time. Um, many of the targets were like what you would think are obvious targets, like uh, government organizations and federal contractors. Uh, then there were some uh, uh, big industry companies. And uh, then there were some, like, comp some, uh, some targets that you probably think are like, completely strange. Um, like around the time of the uh, 2008 Olympics, um, they attacked the International Olympic Committee. Attacking means they were successful in attacking them, um, as well as a couple of local uh, Olympic committees, the World Anti-Doping Association, and at, an at another time, even the United Nations uh, were, uh, were a victim of um, just this operation, just this ra range of attacks. And uh, we could also see how long they had a foothold um, inside the network of their various targets. Um, so we, we have seen that uh, many operations uh, with computers inside the target network being, um, uh, being affected and being, um, being, actively, uh, well, uh, being actively used. Um, some of those operations uh, went on for like 12, um, uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, where uh, basically, uh, basically part of the network of, uh, the, of the victims were under the attacker's control, where then they could like slowly but certainly get at all the interesting data that they uh, wanted to get at, uh, uh, get at in the end. And uh, many companies uh, uh, never noticed uh, before, it's, uh, uh, before that report re was released and we notified them. And uh, then, they'd, um, they, then they had to uh, go back to their systems trying to figure out uh, what happened, what not. And actually, some of the victims weren't even interested in, uh, le in learning about it. Like, well, OK, we've been hacked, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so this, uh, that is well, kind of worrying, kind of strange uh, to see that kind of reaction and uh, that kind of uh, follow-up or not follow-up. Um, then we have seen like another news earthquake happening. Um, you probably have like, heard um, all about Dooku, um, which um, basically is, is only interesting in one little aspect. Apart from that, Dooku is it has not, uh, none of the Stuxnet capabilities. It won't detect PLCs. Um, um, uh, it w uh, won't spread by itself. Uh, basically, Dooku is just one of millions of information-stealing Trojans. Um, the only thing that uh, makes it uh, uh, that makes Dooku particularly interesting is uh, that it has been created by the same group uh, that was behind Stuxnet, and uh, this is becoming interesting. Uh, um, if you remember, who was originally attributed uh, to, um, to be behind Stuxnet? So, whoever you, uh, you believe, it may be the U.S. or Israel, or maybe both combined, or maybe Russia. Um, well, whoever was behind Stuxnet um, is uh, well, now uh, using Dooku uh, to, uh, to commit uh, um, espionage, um, so mostly, in the middle, um, mostly in the Middle East. Interesting enough, there, are, uh, there is also at least one victim from the US and also one victim from England, um, which is, well, kind of strange. And um, well, uh, uh, Dooku and all the other tools are being used uh, for, its, um, uh, for targeted attacks, for espionage, uh, very often are making use of um, uh, rootkit technologies to hide themselves, uh, to, 
in some cases to try to be, um, to, uh, well, simply be invisible uh, for the normal virus scanner technology. And uh, we are actually seeing a massive increase in the use of rootkit technologies, where, uh, where it's now, it's, nowadays it's more like the norm uh, and not so much the exception that uh, Trojans are coming with rootkit functionalities or that actually it, a, a separate rootkit is installed that is then hiding the, uh, the original Trojan. And some of those rootkits are close to impossible to detect uh, for normal system tools. Uh, TDL or TDSS, it's uh, the same name, uh, a different name for the same thing. Um, is one example, which is a fairly big family of uh, rootkits. And um, uh, detecting them uh, is very, very difficult, and especially then removing, um, removing the rootkit. Uh, in many cases, it's easier to just re-image uh, re or reinstall the machine um, when trying to effectively, uh, to effectively combat it, uh, um, against them. And uh, we had, um, now we have also seen rootkits uh, that are using the BIOS to manifest themselves inside. Um, so far, I think we've only uh, seen two different rootkits uh, out in the wild. Um, I think one is uh, attacking a Phoenix BIOS, and another one is attacking uh, a specific um, um, no, a VOD BIOS. And uh, well, detection of this rootkit um, is not that difficult. But you can imagine that removal is limited. So basically, it's, um, the, uh, the removal depends on what, uh, what features uh, your motherboard has. After, damage, uh, after the damage from uh, CIH uh, back in 1999, uh, many motherboards actually come with two BIOSes uh, where you can restore a, de a destroyed BIOS um, with the help of another one. So um, this, uh, on, well, this, well, problems uh, now also leads uh, to some kind of, of uh, well, new technologies uh, that, um, uh, that we are developing, um, which is, uh, well, uh, starting to make use of processor features. Um, you may have seen uh, uh, that McAfee has been acquired by Intel, and since then we have uh, been working fairly close together with them uh, to come up with some kind of new technology that is making use of the virtualization feature uh, that a uh, couple of those processors have. So it's basically, it's, um, um, well, an effective technology against rootkits, which is then, of course, limited to only special, uh, uh, special processors, um, is to, make, um, to have that virtualization uh, technology to monitor t uh, key addresses in kernel memory uh, to monitor all, the, um, all those tables uh, that uh, malware needs to change, in particular the rootkits uh, need to change. So it's, uh, then during boot up, uh, the, um, uh, the access as, and suspicious access to those addresses will be detected. Thus, um, a running rootkit well, will simply be uh, killed uh, while the machine is booting. And uh, with the continuous monitoring of, uh, of, all, the, um, of all those addresses, um, uh, the, it's, uh, the infections um, of a rootkit uh, can, be t uh, can be stopped in the first place. So uh, this is kind of, uh, well, it's new technology that um, I would expect uh, will be like uh, kind of as common as uh, currently all those cloud-based uh, file reputation services are. Um, so so um, using, um, using hardware uh, features to provide more security, that's probably it's, uh, the way that the entire industry uh, will be moving or will have to move um, in the next couple of years. And uh, well, to bypassing the operating system that can so easily be affected or spoofed by a rootkit. Well, with that, uh, here's a couple of more stuff to read. Um, of course, um, our uh, quarterly threat reports, uh, some of the data have already been used here, which will be released on Tuesday. And um, so, uh, one document that is really interesting to read about uh, corporate espionage is from the Office of the National Counterintelligence Executive, um, which uh, goes into a fair, a fair amount of detail of uh, um, what the uh, US uh, services are seeing and all sorts um, whom, uh, who they are accusing of doing what kind of operations. Okay, and uh, with that, I hope I could, uh, well, 
at least uh, uh, tell you some interesting facts, some developments uh, that may have been, uh, that may be a little bit uh, new for you. Um, if there are any more questions uh, that uh, you come up afterwards, just send me an email. And with that, I thank you for your time and patience. <laughs>